night sky full of stars. For eons, human beings have gazed up at its tranquil beauty, taking solace in the peaceful stillness of this vast and eternal cosmic cornucopia. And yet, all the while, lurking beyond our solar system among the billions of stars and the exoplanets that orbit them, is another sort of Milky Way altogether. A far more sinister space. A place only sophisticated space telescopes and imaging processes can reveal. A place of unequaled terrors. Come with us now if you dare and discover the, the galaxy of horrors. <laughs> Feel the reins of terror. The killer you never see coming. With winds of up to 5,400 miles per hour and torrential rains of glass blowing sideways, the weather here is deadly. And don't let its cobalt blue color fool you. This hazy blowtorched atmosphere is riddled with silicon particles, making this an unearthly death trap no mortal would dare want to face. Or discover the zombie worlds that exist in this most inhospitable corner of the galaxy. The Poltergeist Planet, one of three dead planets shambling through the twisted magnetic fields of their corpse star Lich, which is itself the collapsed core of an exploded star. But despite its demise, this undead star spins twin beams of radiation that could incinerate a spaceship foolish enough to venture too close. Even if you could make it to the surface, your nightmares would continue as the radiation from the zombie star rains down on planet Poltergeist, as well as her neighboring dead worlds of Draugr and Furbitor, creating sickly irradiated auroras to light up your certain death. These are just a sampling of the terrible, unwelcoming worlds that inhabit our galaxy of horrors. Hello, everyone, and welcome to one of NASA's remote sessions at South by Southwest. My name is Thalia Khan, and I'm a public engagement specialist for NASA's Exoplanet Exploration Program Office. And this is our universe of horrors. Over the past few years, NASA has been producing a horrific set of posters that showcases the mysterious and terrifying phenomena that exist throughout our universe, reminding us how lucky we are to live on planet Earth. All right, so before we dive in, let's meet the mad scientists and experts from NASA who are joining us today, Dr. Elisa Quintana, Dr. Judy Rackison, and Caitlin Soares. Elisa, do you want to introduce yourself to our audience? Yes, thank you, Talia. Uh, my name is Elisa Quintana. I am an exoplanet scientist um, working at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. Um, so exoplanets are uh, planets orbiting uh, stars outside of our solar system. And so this is something I've been studying for a really long time. Um, I am working on a mission called TESS, which is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. I'm the deputy project scientist, and it's a mission looking for new planets in our solar neighborhood. I also work on the Roman, Nancy Grace Roman Space uh, Telescope. Um, and this is a mission that's also doing a lot of science that you'll hear about today. And uh, my expertise is uh, planet formation and uh, exoplanet habitability. Wonderful, thank you. And Judy, do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself to our audience? Thanks, I'm happy to be here today. I'm Judy Rackison. I'm an astrophysicist also at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in, in Maryland. Uh, I study a particular type of transient uh, astrophysical phenomenon known as gamma ray bursts. These are the most energetic explosions in the universe and I'll tell you a bit more about them uh, later when we get to uh, the, the posters. Um, I work primarily on uh, the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, where I serve as the deputy project scientist. Uh, I also work on the SWIFT, uh, the Neil Garrell SWIFT Observatory, which is another uh, premier observatory for studying uh, high energy transient phenomenon. Um, I use primarily X rays and gamma rays um, to study the extreme universe. Um, and when I'm not uh, studying the extreme universe, I also bake extreme science nerdy cakes, many of which have been featured on NASA Universe, which I encourage you to check out. I would very much like to try one of those cakes. Uh, now, Caitlin, would you like to introduce yourself to our audience? Sure, thanks, Talia. 
Um, hi, South by. My name is Caitlin Soares. I am really excited to join the talent on this panel today. Uh, like Talia, I also work in public outreach for NASA. My focus is on astrophysics. Um, so we design experiences and products that explain NASA missions, science concepts and discoveries. And in everything we create, we want to spark a curiosity that makes you want to learn more. So I think you're going to love what we have to show you today. I think they will love it too. Uh, so just want to reiterate, my name is Thalia Khan. I am a public engagement specialist. I get to work alongside Caitlin and alongside our experts to produce this wonderful content for you guys that really engages you in the science that we do at NASA. So I'm fortunate enough to work with the Exoplanet Exploration Program Office, um, and that allows me to work with amazing uh, scientists and experts in the field of exoplanets and exploration and characterization, uh, which we're going to cover a lot today. So this series was developed in response to another set of posters that we have developed called the Exoplanet Travel Bureau, which is based off of vintage travel poster advertisements um, that advertises places in our galaxy that you would love to visit. In the pictures here, you can see that our colleague and friend Joby Harris is helping us brainstorm ideas for these terrible planets and coming up with a compelling story to excite and inspire curiosity among our audience. People are oftentimes focused on finding life on another planet or habitable worlds, which are planets that have the correct conditions to potentially harbor life. But there is a universe of terrifying and terrible planets that also exist. And I wanted to show the world the diversity that exists among exoplanets. These posters make the unimaginable come to life. They display planets and phenomena that we would only see um, or that we would only think exists in science fiction. We developed these posters in time for Halloween and drew inspiration from B-rated horror movies to showcase the truly horrific monsters that exist in our universe. My colleague Caitlin took the series further and visualized other astrophysics events that will keep you up at night. So as Thalia mentioned, our horrific poster series began with a focus on terrible exoplanets in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, that you would never want to visit. Um, as another Halloween approached in 2020, we revisited the Galaxy of Horrors campaign and considered ways that we could grow it into a universe. Um, we wanted to expand the gallery from planetary or exoplanetary to astrophysics. So first, we, we brought together our artists and our scientists, like Judy and Elisa, to discuss uh, the terrifying phenomena that exist in the entire universe. We wanted to convey NASA's astrophysics data and research as sci-fi come to life. Through a lot of discussion, we narrowed down the concepts for the new universe posters to a dead galaxy, which you're seeing on the left. Um, this was observed by the Hubble Space Telescope, deadly gamma rays in the center, and then on the right, mysterious dark matter, which we'll talk about a little later. The Galactic Gra Gra Graveyard is the first poster in our series uh, that we're going to talk about today. This is a, a really interesting result, and I'm just going to start with some of the background information to, to put this in context. This is a diagram known as the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. This is a really basic thing that we use um, in astronomy to understand the life cycle of stars. Uh, stars form at a variety of masses, masses like our, 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 the mass of our sun and much smaller, and also stars that can be tens or even hundreds of times larger than, than our sun. The uh, smaller stars live longer. It takes them longer to actually like, burn their fuel and, and live their normal life cycle. And very massive stars have very short lives. Another characteristic we can tell about stars and their age is their color. Typically, because those small, um, small low mass stars live a long time, they tend to, um, they, they evolve through their sequence, but on average, they tend to be redder, whereas very massive young stars tend to be bluer and they might spend a little bit of their time as red stars, but generally we see them as emitting blue light. We can use this to, as a proxy to understand the stellar populations in galaxies. Go to the next slide, you see that there are different types of galaxies. Like our Milky Way galaxy that we live in, it's a big spiral galaxy with a variety of types of stars living at different points in their life cycles. There are uh, stars that live quite a long time, like our sun, for about 10 billion years, um, as well as stars that live only a few million years, as these massive stars, which, which we can tell that they, they die where they live in these stellar nurseries, which are indicated by typically by this blue light. 
Um, there are other types of galaxies like giant elliptical galaxies. We think these form by big spirals like these merging together, um, which is something we actually can see in process throughout the universe. Typically elliptical galaxies are filled with these older stellar population because the act of merging actually uses up a lot of that gas that forms new stars. It happens suddenly and then they kind of quietly get redder. Uh, in the, the case that we're talking about with uh, the galaxy that inspired this poster, um, this was a result from the Hubble Space Telescope where they found a very rare, very strange little red disk galaxy. And because of what the way I just explained how galaxies evolve and, and merge and, and, and how that disrupts those disk structures, this is kind of strange. Um, we don't quite understand why, but there must have been something in this galaxy's history that caused the gas to be lost um, that would have formed new stars. And then the stars that were just there gradually age and get redder. On the next slide, um, you can see how this really inspired the idea that there's this, this dead galaxy and, and, and how the planets, I guess, around it uh, remain. Yeah, and what I really love about this galactic graveyard poster is how we used contrasting colors to scientifically communicate the real death and decay happening in this galaxy. Um, Judy mentioned that generally red stars are at the end of their life cycle. So we have this brilliantly red looming star taking up most of the space in the poster. In the foreground as well, um, she mentioned the exoplanet. We took the artistic liberty to include this exoplanet shaped like a skull that might have been blasted and damaged in the final death throes of its star. Um, I think the, it, it, in a way, we, we also included the exoplanet as a nod to the origins of this poster campaign, which originally focused on exoplanets. So I'm going to now talk about a really um, scary system, um, this time a planet around the, the star Aumic. Um, this is a very young star that is really throwing these vicious temper tantrums in the form of huge erupting stellar flares. Next slide, please. So Aumic is a star that's smaller than the sun. It's about 32 light years away. And at 22 million years old, it's really considered young by cosmic standards, uh, considering our sun is four and a half billion years old. And it's a really famous system because we've observed a, a vast disk of gas and dust around, which you can see in the top right. And usually when you see di these types of disks, uh, typically means that planets are forming within them. And so since we see this disk edge on, um, it's, a, it's an excellent place to try to look for planets crossing in front of their star or transiting. Uh, next slide. And so the TESS mission did just that. Uh, TESS is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Um, what it's been doing is staring at the entire sky, uh, looking at um, individual star brightnesses over time. And the way it detects planets, as you see in the top right, is that it looks for planets crossing in front of a star, which will cause a periodic dip in brightness. And by looking at AUMIC for a long time, uh, just this past year, uh, scientists were able to discover a planet about Neptune size um, orbiting AUMIC in, in about an eight-day orbit. So this is a really exciting discovery. Um, what's really interesting is that uh, young stars like AUMIC um, are highly magnetically active. And we can use the same data that we use to search for planets to really understand their stellar activity. Um, so what you see um, on the left is the light curve of the whole star. And so you see these kind of waves coming in and out, which are really uh, showing you the spots rotating into, into and out of view, um, so the change in brightness. And you can see these spikes. And so this is caused by these large stellar flaring um, events. And you can see the actual data we collected from tests on the bottom. And the way we find planets is we, we typically remove all these features, um, but you can learn a wealth of data from this. And so, uh, you know, in the top right, we could see this huge solar flare from our sun and the earth to scale. Earth is really small and um, really the earth is far enough away that these flares aren't deadly to us. Um, from the largest recorded solar flare, um, in history, I think it, it basically took out some communications, uh, started some fires, but it wasn't really deadly to any life on Earth. Um, for stars like AMIC and the planet around it, uh, we have flares that are hundreds and hundreds of times larger than the, than the largest uh, solar flare ever recorded. And not only that, they happen um, daily and even 
on hour long time scales. And because you have this planet in an eight day orbit, it's constantly being blasted. And so it's a really, really uh, difficult place to, if, to um, find you know, any life on it. Um, and so uh, the next slide you'll see how all of the science was translated into the poster. And uh, Talia is gonna talk about um, what went into this poster, um, the, what you can see in the different perspectives that were all uh, created by um, input from scientists. Thank you, Elisa. That was a uh, fantastic overview of the science uh, behind this poster, which is truly fascinating. And I want to touch a little bit more on the topic of the flares of fury in this poster, which is really what makes this movie so terrifying. So these flares are much bigger than the ones we've ever seen from our sun. And that, might, that makes the system you know, a very inhospitable place in our galaxy. So this young system seems to be throwing a tantrum. It is a young, volatile, hostile star, and the planets in the system would most likely not be able to harbor any life as we know it. And we worked really closely with you, Elisa, and some of the other folks from the test team to really make the star come to life and show just why it is a monster in our universe that will keep you up at night. And a lot of work goes into taking the data that you observe and translating that into colors and shapes and images. And I know in particular, we had to work a lot on what the disk of dust in, dust in the background would look like and what the perspective of the star would be from this view on the planet. Um, so I think we did a fantastic job uh, illustrating what this terrifying system of planets and stars could look like. Um, it perfectly captures the story of a young red hot star that is holding its planets captive and ceaselessly tormenting them with x-rays and other radiation. So it's truly a place we would not want to visit, but it's definitely a movie I would want to watch. Now we're going to listen to Judy uh, and we're going to learn more about gamma rays. Speaking of stars I would not want to live around. Um, gamma ray ghouls depicts a specific phenomenon known as a gamma ray burst. Uh, it's not a great name, maybe we should have named them gamma ray ghouls, but they are uh, the most energetic explosions in the universe that are, uh, for the first indication we see of them is a burst of gamma rays. They're by no means the only sources of burst in gamma rays, but this is the phenomenon that, uh, that, that this, is, this is based upon. This diagram depicts what's going on inside a gamma ray burst. They're actually produced by two different types of phenomenon. One is a very massive star. At the end of its life, it uses up its fuel and it collapses to form a new black hole or perhaps temporarily a neutron star. And the other type is a variety of two neutron stars that are in a binary system orbiting each other. Uh, they're the long dead survivors of a massive star system that, of two stars that went supernova probably a billion years earlier. And the stars somehow stay in that binary even through these two supernovae and eventually merge together. Either way, both of these phenomena produce uh, this, this light show that starts as a burst of gamma rays lasting anywhere from a fraction of a second to hundreds, maybe even thousands of seconds in some, some extreme cases. Uh, material is ejected in a, in a beam, beamed cone of radiation and uh, as different blobs of material crash into each other that produces this var variable um, volatile uh, emission of gamma rays. And then eventually that blast wave that's traveling at nearly the speed of light starts interacting with the surrounding environment. And that produces an afterglow that we detect across the electromagnetic spectrum, from radio uh, to optical, uh, to ultraviolet, to X-ray. And even if we see it in, in high energy gamma rays where we have some sensitive detectors, we occasionally see emission from these events. The mo one of the most impressive light shows we've seen at this event was something that happened back in 2017. As you see on the next slide, um, this is depicting an event where we also detected gravitational radiation from this, gravitational waves. Uh, this was a really momentous uh, discovery because it demonstrated that although we were pretty sure that neutron star mergers produce gamma ray bursts, this was, this was the really clear signal of neutron stars merging together we can measure from the gravitational waves coincident with the gamma ray burst detected by the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. On the next slide, uh, you can see uh, an artist depiction of how this event occurred. Here are these two neutron stars merging together, getting it closer, closer, faster, faster. And those jets of emission interacting with the surrounding environment. And then actually an even, even, even more um, sort of surprising signature that we saw most clearly in this event was a signal of a kilonova, which is uh, evidence of 
heavy element formation that happens in the environment um, surrounding, surrounding these events. And so this amazing light show and this discovery uh, is what inspired the poster um, where I don't, I'm, I don't study planets. Um, I don't, you know, I'd never really thought about until we started talking about this of what it would be like to be in a planet around this event, but um, it wouldn't be a very hospitable place. So as, as we learned from Judy, um, gamma rays are the most energetic form of light. And this is portrayed in the poster through the bright glowing colors of the burst caused by the two colliding neutron stars. Um, I think what really makes this poster stand out from the entire series is the appearance of humans. Uh, this is the only poster we've made so far that shows human space travelers who, as, as we can see in the poster, are in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, the, the rays are not technically touching the space travelers, but uh, we leave it up to the audience's imagination to determine the outcome of this horror movie. Another really interesting planetary system that we found around uh, some of these neutron stars um, just, you know, is wildly unexpected. So this is the uh, PSR for Pulsar, uh, B125712. Next slide, please. So in the early 90s, uh, three small planets were discovered around the Pulsar. And so these Pulsars are uh, basically a pair of rapidly rotating neutron stars. Um, so we've learned all about those. Um, but essentially, they're the smallest and densest uh, visible objects in the universe. And um, these uh, interesting planets were the first ever found since uh, Neptune's discovery in 1846. Uh, they absolutely weren't predicted or expected because people that were searching for planets <clears throat> were really looking for planets orbiting sun-like stars, uh, you know, those that we know of. So it was, that was one reason it was a surprise. Um, so in the background, you can see this pulsar and this amazing um, magnetic field environment that's kind of lit up with, with this blue glow. And next slide. And so, uh, this, you know, as I mentioned, the discovery of these pulsar planets was totally unexpected. Um, and just to think, a pulsar is really the collapsed core of a massive, like sun-like object becoming bright enough to outshine its entire parent galaxy in a, in a supernova event. So, if you can Im imagine this this really violent event, um, and you know, how can planets even survive after that? And so, the fact that they exist around the system. Is, is truly remarkable. Um, so the, the pulsars spin, um, they actually have this really precise timing and it's almost like a lighthouse beacon. Um, uh, and so any planets around it are actually gonna be receiving these lethal X-rays and gamma rays. And so, you know, it was thought that any planets that survived uh, the supernova could not exist. But in fact, we found, you know, more systems like this. And so it really, throws up a lot of questions like how these planets even formed. Uh, next slide. And so uh, here's a, an example of, you know, what one of these planets would look like. Uh, they're small sort of earth mass planets. And uh, we've been calling them zombie worlds because they, you know, are around this undead star. And uh, the planets were named um, uh, Dragar, Phobitar, and Poltergeist so that, gives you a pretty good indication on whether they're a good place to live. And uh, thank you. And here's the poster um, that these planets uh, motivated. And Talia can tell you about uh, what went into these ones. Yeah, so there was definitely a lot of back and forth uh, on this poster with like the scientists. Um, you know, it's definitely a system that we don't know as much about as we would like to. Um, like you were saying, Elisa, we don't know if these planets survived that initial explosion. And so they're just like corpses of, you know, dead planets orbiting this dead star, um, or if they came in after the explosion. Um, in either case, it's kind of an unusual situation. Um, but what makes this uh, system and this poster and this you know, movie truly terrifying um, is this pulsar star, right? That's just blasting these planets with radiation, um, you know, gamma rays and X-rays. So um, these planets surviving that explosion or coming into the system after um, is definitely unusual, but it just creates the perfect scenario for a horror movie, right? These undead planets. Um, orbiting 
this star that is, you know, basically trying to sterilize anything that could possibly exist on this planet. Um, so this was a really fun poster to work on. Um, you know, it's really fun to see that sometimes we don't know everything about a system, sometimes we don't know everything about a planet, but what we do know can produce a compelling um, and just visually stunning image. Um, so you can see here, um, we played around with adding skulls in the background. So if you can see that in the, um, you know, clouds of dust and uh, gases in the background. Um, so this is, you know, an amazing and fun uh, poster to work on. And it, it really did, uh, you know, excite me and, you know, bring a lot of, um, you know, spark a lot of curiosity into what other unusual systems um, and phenomena we can find in the universe. Dark matter. This is a fun subject because uh, even just the name evokes this idea of that it's mysterious and, and scary. Um, but we actually study dark matter. We know it's there and there's a lot of different ways in which uh, we can explore it. And the next slide uh, is, a, is an animation showing what a galaxy, uh, what it looks like rotating versus what we would have expected if we knew that there were only stars there. Uh, what we see on the left is that the stars and the galaxy are rotating much, much faster, of course, than it really does. And in our galaxy, this takes a couple hundred million years to do one rotation. But the we can tell from studying galaxies and measuring the movements of stars and, and gas that moves throughout a galaxy that the um, there's a lot more mass there. Uh, and it extends well beyond the, the distribution of stars um, than we would expect if we just looked at the rotation of, of a galaxy alone. And the next slide uh, is, is a, animation that demonstrates how we study what dark matter is actually made of. Um, we don't know yet, but there are a lot and lot of theories out there. And one is the, the WIMP, the weakly interacting massive particle. This is a particle that we've, we've never discovered in nature, but uh, is being searched for in particle accelerators. Um, and as well as we look for the signature um, in astrophysical uh, sources, that perhaps there are dark matter particles that when they hit each other, they align, uh, annihilate, and this would produce a signal in the gamma rays. And although we haven't conclusively detected it, um, we are able to place limits on the mass of this particle, which tells us a lot about um, what it could be made of and, and how there could be enough of these to, to explain the majority of mass in the universe, because um, we know that dark matter constitutes um, uh, most, of the, most of the mass um, in, in large scales. Uh, on the next slide, um, this is a depiction of a phenomenon known as gravitational lensing. Uh, this is how we can map the distributions of dark matter. Um, this is a really interesting, not only observational technique, but an amazing feature of physics. Um, and this is even, this animation is kind of showing you what some real images that we actually could detect of galaxy clusters. And the idea that is if you have a huge massive potential well, it can actually ask, act as a lens. Light gets bent as it passes around it. So you have a cluster in back, you have a, a galaxy cluster in the, in the far away, you have a ga galaxy cluster in between, and you can actually see galaxies stretched out. And depending on how much they're stretched out, you can use that to map um, the map matter distribution in the galaxy, uh, sorry, in the universe. And this is something that telescopes um, like the Roman telescope will do with amazing accuracy. And on the next slide, this is a, a map from um, actually a, a ground-based survey called the Dark Energy Survey. Um, which maps the distance to galaxies. And by doing that, we can see how um, both dark matter and visible matter clusters in something that starts looking like a web, what's known as the cosmic web. Um, and that's uh, what inspired uh, some of the artwork in this poster. I find this poster the most horrifying simply because I hate spiders. <laughs> but what I like about it is that through the art, we've made a connection between the mysterious cosmic web, the structure of the universe that Judy just touched upon, and Earth. Um, the, the perspective of this poster is on Earth. We can see a familiar tree line, and we're viewing the cosmic web in the sky above us. The brighter spots in the cosmic web are the normal matter that we can see, like galaxies, stars, planetary systems, you and me, while the gaps represent dark matter. And so when we're talking about astrophysical concepts, it can be difficult to envision what they are and how they affect us here on Earth, but we're also a part of the universe. And as humans, we're working hard to better understand it. I think our artist for this specific poster did a great job in making that connection. 
And at the same time, he maintained a style of mystery and creepiness for the poster. Okay, great. Um, I'm next going to talk about another uh, exoplanet called HD 189733b, which is one of the more, most horrifying uh, planets out there in terms of um, hospitable atmospheres. Uh, next. Uh, so if you were traveling in space and you were to come across this planet, you would see this kind of, you know, bluish marble similar to what we see from Earth. Um, but if you were going to confuse it with something cushy like Earth, uh, that would be a, a huge mistake. Um, so we know that our, our Earth looks blue from space um, because we have uh, lots of ocean coverage that absorb red and green wavelengths and um, more strongly reflect some of the blue ones. Uh, we also have the bluish hue of the sky. And, you know, because we have this nice habitable planet, um, we, we know what to look for, you know, when looking for other nice places uh, to live. And um, so on this planet, uh, this sort of dark cobalt color uh, does not come from the reflection of an ocean or from a, a nice blue sky. Um, it actually has this really hazy and turbulent atmosphere um, that's laced with silicate glass. And so it's, it's these uh, small glass particles in the atmosphere that are actually reflecting the blue light. Uh, next slide. So this planet, uh, which we call hot Jupiter, um, was discovered by the radial velocity method. It's a method different from the transit method I talked about earlier. Um, and it's sometimes called the Doppler wobble method. And basically it's um, indirectly measuring a planet uh, by the tug it induces on the star. So we see different motion from the star um, just because of the planet's presence. And uh, this is a sizzling gas giant planet that revolves about every two days around its star. Um, and so that, you know, that means it's really hot. Um, it's, it's actually uh, above a thousand degrees. And so it's definitely a poor place to harbor life. Uh, next. So what's really cool is that um, about 10 years ago, uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope was able to map the planet's temperature. Um, that's because it is a, is, it's a planet that was close enough that we could study it um, with our uh, big space telescopes. And, and what it was able to do is measure this brightness uh, surface map of the planet's temperature. So this is the first map ever published of an alien world. Um, and uh, when you see the bright spots, that means that's where the planet is hot um, and vice versa. And so what you immediately can see is it has this hot spot, but it's not centered in the middle. It's sort of shifted. So that tells us a lot about uh, what's going on in this world. Um, so uh, scientists think that there are ferocious winds that are probably pushing this hot spot to the east. Um, and this makes, you know, if you think about weather in this turbulent atmosphere, um, it really makes you think about how, how deadly it could be uh, to live on this planet. So you have howling winds blowing up to 5,400 miles an hour uh, from the day side to the night side, and uh, you have raining glass. And so as the poster said, it's, it's really death by a million cuts on the slasher planet if you were to live on it. And Tully is gonna tell you more about this, this really cool poster that I love. Yeah, I think this is one of uh, my favorite posters because it's just like the wildest thing that you can imagine on a planet. Like what evil person thought of, <laughs> you know, a planet where it rains glass sideways. Um, you know, so it's, it's truly terrifying, definitely a place I would not want to visit, and actually something that, you know, could potentially keep you up at night, right? So, you know, it's a, it's a planet that is, you know, nice and blue when you first look at it, um, but when you get into the dense atmosphere of the planet um, that probably doesn't have a core because it's a gas giant, um, all you will be greeted with is, uh, you know, this terrible uh, storm of glass and heat. Um, so it, it's a it's a really big planet. It's really close to its star, um, you know, and it's just not not a place you would want to visit. And in the poster, you know, you can see that we have this, um, you know, this poor little robot spacecraft that we dare to send uh, to the planet that somehow made it through the atmosphere, um, landed on whatever core exists there, um, and is now getting torn to shreds. So. Um, 
this was definitely a fun one. There was a lot of back and forth between scientists and artists trying to figure out exactly how to get the right color of blue, um, you know, how to get the right visualization of the star and how to visualize glass raining sideways. So I don't think any of us want to imagine what that would look like and what that would feel like. Um, so this was, this was a, a truly fun project to work on. And I'm so glad to have, you know, worked with experts such as you, Elisa, and Judy and Caitlin to produce this series and make it come alive um, and, you know, show the world what exists out there in the universe. Um, so we have had a lot of wonderful reception of the posters, um, you know, a lot of uh, you know, public outlets, you know, picked up the story when we released them, um, you know, they're fantastic on social media, people absolutely love them. And it's just so nice to see that a lot of the work that we put into it, um, you know, is, is, is gaining traction and people are absolutely loving it. So we have a lot of media exposure. Um, but one other thing that I would like to mention here is that we also produce these posters in Spanish. So if you want to know what a galaxy of horrors sounds like in Spanish, um, you know, go ahead and check them out on our website. Um, but we wanted to make science more accessible to the public. So by making these posters, by translating them in Spanish, um, we hope to accomplish that. Um, so we hope to continue this series. Um, so Caitlin will tell you a little bit about what's to come in the future. Um, but we also want to hear from you. So if you have a sick, twisted mind and you can imagine some of these terrifying worlds or some of these terrifying phenomena, please tweet us at, next, at NASA Exoplanets and NASA Universe or use the hashtag uh, NASA Horrors and tell us what next um, you know, we should produce, what other posters we should produce, what other terrifying worlds or phenomena we should visualize. Now, before we go any further, I do want to ask everyone one last question. Um, so if you can all take some time to just think about what the most terrifying phenomena in your area of science is uh, and share with us. So uh, Judy, if you want to go first and share what your sick and twisted mind can imagine. So normally black holes get all the attention. Like there are these mysterious phenomena and they're super scary, but actually neutron stars are so much scarier because they don't just have the extreme gravity you have in a black hole. They also have the extreme magnetic fields and the radiation and um, just all of these ways in which neutron stars could kill you. Um, but they're also some of the most fun, like fascinating objects in the universe that we study both in our own galaxy and we can see across the universe. And, and I think just neutron stars should get more attention than black holes sometimes. All right, so Elisa, can you tell us what the most terrifying thing in the universe is that you can imagine? Sure. So what I think is really scary are what we call rogue planets or free floating planets. Um, these are planets that we've discovered uh, that don't seem to have any host star. So they're just kind of floating around in space. Um, and it's, it's sort of the contrast to the AUMIC uh, environment. Um, on AUMIC, you know, on the poster, it says you, if you lived on this planet, you would be basically begging for eternal darkness. Um, if you can imagine living on a rogue planet, um, at some point we think that these formed around stars and maybe got ejected. We don't really understand how they formed. Um, but if that were the case and something perturbed them so they separated from their star, you can imagine if there was any life on it, you know, you would just know you're doomed because you're going away from that light source. Or maybe life evolved differently on these planets, who knows. Um, but the uh, Roman Space Telescope is going to be searching for more of these, and I think we're going to uh, understand a lot of them. But to me, I think that just seems like a really scary situation to be in, eternal darkness. It definitely does sound like a, a sad life for rogue planets and very lonely. <laughs> <laughs> um, Caitlin, do you want to tell us what the most terrifying thing is that you can imagine? Sure. Um, I'll challenge Judy on this. I think black holes are terrible. Uh, if you make the mistake of getting pulled clo too close to a black hole, uh, you'll get spaghettified, which means essentially the immense gravity of the black hole will stretch you out like spaghetti. And I think that sounds horrible. So horrible that black holes are actually the inspiration of our next poster, which we'll be launching next month in April. 
Um, so as Thalia said, if you follow NASA Exoplanets and at NASA Universe on Twitter, um, we'll have a treat for you next month that you can see on, that will be launching on our social media accounts. But yeah, for me, definitely black holes. And black holes, I think, are truly terrifying. I don't think there's any competition among all of them. I think they're just, all of these phenomena are, are very, very scary, and you'd never want to encounter them. Um, so for me, I actually think, and I'll, I'll sort of uh, agree with Judy, but for slightly different reasons, I think strange matter um, is actually really, really terrifying. Um, so strange matter, or strange quark matter um, is something that actually exists in the core, or it's hypothesized to exist in the core of neutron stars. Um, and it's this weird matter that if it ever gets out of the core of the neutron stars can infect the entire universe and the entire galaxy that, that it's in. Um, so that keeps me up at night. Um, you know, that's something that you have absolutely no control over. And if it ever just decides to escape one day, um, we're all goners. So. Um, Glad to fuel your nightmares, um, but we really appreciate you guys taking the time uh, to listen to our panel today. Um, we really appreciate all of the support that you guys have provided us. And you know, we really love producing all these amazing um, products and artwork and content for you guys to enjoy science and find the fascination that we do. Um, so please go ahead and download our posters at exoplanets.nasa.gov. Follow us on our social media at NASA Exoplanets and at NASA Universe. Stay tuned for more posters and be sure to download them all when they arrive. And I would also like to thank our fantastic panel of speakers and experts who contribute a lot of their time and effort to creating these wonderful products, but also finding these strange and weird phenomena and daring to study them. So thank you all for joining us and until next time. Thank you.